Okay, welcome to my first ever screencast. This is our world and the diversity of life. You should have your note outline alongside with you, and we're ready to go. So scientists have um, identified about one million species so far, and it's predicted that tens of millions of more are yet to be discovered in places like the ocean and the rainforest. Animals by far are the most physically diverse kingdom of life. We'll talk about the kingdoms in just a second, but you can look at all the pictures there and we have uh, animals that can swim and fly and insects and things that don't even really look like an animal at all. So very diverse kingdom. What I would like you to do now is hit pause on the screencast while you brainstorm five things that you think all animals have to contain in order to be an animal. So I am sure that you came up with some great things on your list. Um, we're going to go through the derived characteristics of animals right now. So on your note outline, jot these things down. All animals are heterotrophic. That means that they are consumers. All animals are multicellular. That means that they have or can contain more than one cell. There are some animals that just have one cell, like an amoeba. All animal cells are support supported by something called collagen. All animals are diploid for the most part. That means that they have a full set of chromosomes, one set from mom, one set from dad. Most animals reproduce sexually, and most animals contain Hox genes, and I'll talk about those on the next slide. So Hox genes are a pattern of development, and you can see on this slide that we have um, different genes that are controlling, oh, sorry about that, hold on, put that back, go to my pencil. We have different genes that are located in different regions that control the pattern of development for the head region. We have different genes down here then that are controlling patterns of development in the tail region. Okay, one more brainstorm. I forgot that I had the ability to write the first five slides or so. Now we're on slide seven now. Um, so in these spaces, on your notes, I want you to brainstorm this time how we differentiate between different animals. How do we go about categorizing them and putting them into different groups? Brainstorm now, pause the screencast, go. One of the first ways that we can start to categorize animals into different groups is to determine whether or not they have a backbone or don't have a backbone. So animals with a backbone are called vertebrates, and animals without backbones are called invertebrates. And if we look at the percentages of animals with a backbone, it's less than 5%. That's not many at all. And I would guess that when most of us think of animals, we think of a horse or a dog or something with a backbone. But it turns out that more than 95% of animal species are invertebrates. They don't have a backbone. So this slide shows you a nice pie chart of what we were just talking about, the 95% versus 5%. Uh, most, 86% of invertebrates, now this is invertebrates, are arthropods, 6% uh, are mollusks, 5% are worms, 3% are the sponges, cnidarians, that C is silent, in cnidarians right here, I just, you can't see it anymore, but the C is silent, echinoderms, and then other animals. So those are the invertebrates by group, and we'll talk about those different groups. Now, we can't uh, get away from this topic without a little biology humor. Uh, if you remember, I don't know, three, four years ago now, there was the Occupy Wall Street movement. Well, this is the Octopi Wall Street 
with uh, all of the invertebrates protesting and saying, we are the 97% of animal diversity. It's a very important group that I think are underestimated in uh, their importance and um, just their sheer numbers in our world today. Okay, so for the animal phyla, early classification system divided animals into vertebrates or invertebrates, like we talked about. This is a little bit outdated today. Now we divide animals into 30 phylum. We have that kingdom phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So I'll write those letters over on the side here. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And a good mnemonic to remember this would be king, Philip came over for good spaghetti. Um, the phyla is what we are talking about now, so these 30 phyla. Each phyla has a unique body plan, has a unique set of anatomical characteristics, and represents a different way that a multicellular animal is put together. All right, so this is the old kingdom of, or the old system of classification. We used five kingdoms, animal kingdom, plants, protists, monera, and fungi. This is outdated, okay? We still have the animal kingdom, we still have the plant kingdom, we still have the protists, and we still have the fungi, However, the Monera is now broken down into two groups. We have the bacteria, just the plain old bacteria, and then we also have the archaea bacteria, okay? Or just archaea. But these are the ancient extreme bacteria that live in extreme environments. So those now are domain bacteria, domain archaea, and then we have domain eukarya. And these four groups belong in domain eukarya because they are eukaryotic or made up of eukaryotic cells. So on your notes, jot down that big circle is the eukarya or eukaryota domain. Then we have the archaea and the bacteria. So here is another example of the tree of life showing the branching. I know when we talked about evolution um, and you saw in Darwin's Dangerous Idea, that awesome movie, um, you saw the branching. And I know I talked about in... Um, his book, The Origin of Species, one of the only diagrams that he had showed something like this, a branching kind of with a common ancestor and then different groups branching off of that. So again, here is our Linnaean classification system. I already talked about the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, which is right here. And you just need to remember that domain is at the top. That is the biggest group. So you can have domain eukarya, you can have domain bacteria, or you can have domain archaea. And then whatever domain you're in, if let's say you're in the eukarya, and now we're talking about animal kingdom, which is what we're doing, you're right here. Now we're going to talk about some different phyla. This diagram shows the classification of one of my favorites. Um, the gray wolf. It is um, Canis lupus with, with its genus species name. And remember, when you're talking about genus species name, the gene that's usually shown in italics, and the genus name is capitalized, the species name is all lower letters. So now we need to talk about how animal phyla are determined. Basically, we use three criteria the body plan symmetry, tissue layers, and developmental patterns, which we're going to talk about each one of those more in detail.
So the Okay, so sorry about that. This again is my first ever screencast, so there are going to be a few mistakes. I thought I wasn't recording, but then I thought I was recording. But let's get back to this. So there are two basic body plans, um, radial and bilateral. Radial is pretty easy. Whoops. Here is my pen again. Radial is body parched parts arranged around a central axis. So it kind of looks like a circle. That is radial. Next is bilateral symmetry. So if you are not shaped like a circle and have radial symmetry, you're going to have bilateral symmetry. Um, this is basically a mirror image side. So you have a left half and you have a right half. Um, we can also talk about the terms anterior, posterior, posterior, um, dorsal, and ventral. So anterior is going to be your head region, posterior is going to be your tail region, dorsal is going to be your back. If you think of a dolphin and their dorsal fins, those are the fins on the top of them, on their backs. And then the ventral side is going to be your belly. One last thing on this slide, there's a term called cephalization. Cephalization means basically that you have sensory organs that are concentrated at the front end. So you have a head region. Sometimes it's super advanced, like our heads and our brains. Other times it is not, like we'll get to a flatworm and they just have kind of these um, light sensing uh, detectors in their head region, but that is still an example of cephalization. All right, we're almost done here. Uh, thanks for sticking with me through my first ever screencast. Um, I'm going to want your feedback on how you liked it, uh, how you think it would work, if it was a better way of delivering notes. Um, so be prepared to Give me your feedback. Let's finish up with tissue layers. So um, bilateral animals. So again, these are the ones with left and right sides. They have three distinct tissue layers. Okay, And we can call them triploblastic. Look at that prefix. Tri means three. All right. We have an ectoderm. We have an endoderm. And we have a mesoderm. Ectoderm is basically your outer layer, your endoderm is your inner layer, and your mesoderm, think of M, M, the middle, mesoderm is going to be your middle layer. Radial animals, so these are your circular body plans, only have two distinct layers of tissue. Okay, They do not have the mesoderm layer. Basically, they just have the outer layer and the inner layer. All right, and then lastly, we have developmental patterns. We kind of have two funny words which describe kind of two funny ways of developing protostomes and deuterostomes. Protostomes here form their mouth region first and the anus second. So examples of these types of animals that are protostomes are flatworms, annelids, mollusks, roundworms, arthropods, all of those not super complex, all right? Deuterostomes, these are the animals that are going to form the anus first and then the mouth. These would be your echinoderms and chordates, all right? Humans, us, we are chordates, we have backbones. So deuterostome development is kind of the more complex type of developing I might need to get myself a stylus so I can write better than with my finger because that says mirror more. Okay, um, so that is protostomes and deuterostomes. All right, what I'd like you to do on your notes with this slide is fill in the names of the organisms along the top where you see the pictures on your notes. 
and then you can also fill in the derived care or the ex the more common names. This is the phyla names along the top: Periphera, Nadaria, Platyomentes. Um, if we look at mollusks, we don't usually say, well, that was in Nemo, but we don't usually say, hey, there's a mollusk. We say, hey, there's a snail. So these are then the common names. All right, so get as much from this slide onto your notes as possible. And same thing with the next slide. So this is just looking at our vertebrates. Um, the, again, uh, Complex names are up here. This is more of a common name. Also try to get the features of each of these groups into the boxes on your notes. And that wraps up my first ever screencast. Congratulations to you guys for getting to listen to that for the first time. Um, again, I'm going to want your feedback, and we will talk about any of the concepts that you have questions about in class when we meet next, because I don't know if you're going to do this over the weekend or next week. Thanks. Bye.